Oh, I'm so, I'm so proud of this. Everyone do this. Everyone add shapes to your belts. I don't care if you do it my way or not, just it's such a cool look. Greetings adventurers, my name is Kramer, and I'm sitting here at my work table here today because I'm gonna show you how I made uh, a shape for just a standard leather belt. This is the little piece, decorative piece that goes on the end. It adds a little bit of weight, and the piece here is leather as well, and it was actually very simple to make. Now, most of this video is going to be in real time. I'm gonna be taking you through the process while I'm actually doing it and experimenting with things, so hopefully that's helpful. Cutting back to me here in the future once it's done, just to fill in some of the gaps. So a number of the steps that I'm going to be doing with this are not at all necessary. When I say that this can be as simple or as complicated as you want, you can do all of these steps, you can add steps, you can make it as nice as you want to, um, or you can pretty much stop at any point and just call it a day uh, and have a shape on the end of your belt. And the idea with this build is that it would be something easy enough uh, for anyone to do, regardless of your skill level with leather, and maybe even as a teaching tool, it's a very small project, you don't have to worry about screwing up a whole lot, so it might be a nice entry point for some people if you're looking to get into leather Leather. you don't have to worry about wasting materials and tons and tons of money. So let's get started. So we are doing this mostly in real time, actually. I haven't tested this out beforehand, but I have a feeling it's actually going to be very, very simple. So uh, we only have a couple of things that we need to work with here. We have our belt that we're going to be using. If you don't know what sort of belt you're looking for, uh, you can go ahead and check the link uh, for the video that's pinned up there. And we're just using a little bit of scrap leather. Now, uh, just glancing at this, I'm using leather that's probably about uh, a three millimeter thickness. It's a little bit less than the weight of the belt. I don't think I want anything over because we are going to be doing both sides for this shape. Um, and if it's too thick, it's gonna end up looking a little bit strange. So the first thing that we need to do, we have our scrap leather, we have the belt, is we need to determine uh, the overall length that we would like the shape to be. Now for me, that is going to be pretty much up until this first belt hole, which is right here. Uh, and I think that's going to give us a good length. So the first thing that we need to do uh, to prepare the leather is just make sure that we have the squared off ends here that are going to be uh, the back end of the shape. And then we're gonna do this super simple so that we don't have to cut anything out uh, really um, to shape. We're just gonna glue everything to the belt blank and then we're going to cut around uh, the excess and then that's gonna give us a nice really flush fit. So the important thing to remember here is that you, can, you have to glue one side, then trim it, then you can glue the other side, then trim it. You can't glue them both at once because then it's gonna be really hard to cut to the belt blank. Uh, so first thing we gotta do is we just have to make note uh, roughly leaving ourselves a little bit of excess here to trim off so that we can cut another piece so that we can do both sides. So there we go, very, very simple. We have two pieces. I mean, these tails I could just cut off to make things a little bit easier on myself. So with the back end here that's gonna be uh, towards the rest of the belt, you could be as fancy or as uh, plain as you want to. I'm just gonna have a straight line going across, so it's gonna look like that, but you could have like sort of a, a swirl or a dome or something like that if you wanted to. I'm just gonna keep it very simple. So we're just gonna rough this up gently and then we're gonna glue over it so no one's really gonna see it. And if you're doing what I'm doing, this is a belt you don't care about, so not that worried about ruining it in the long run. Okay, very, very quick. I have a feeling we'll be able to get this done uh, in just a couple of hours. And with the extra steps I'm doing, it's gonna take a little bit longer because we're gonna be waiting uh, for the paint to dry. But um, if you were just doing this as the most basic version, it would take you maybe an hour or something like that. So just gonna go ahead and lay down some paper and then we're going to get the glue. I'm using just a standard sort of DAP contact cement here. That is what I would recommend. You could use a white glue or a leather craft glue like this, um, but that's not gonna hold super well permanently. So if you're gonna stitch it or heavily rivet the leather shape down to the belt afterwards, you can just use the white glue to keep everything in place. But if you're counting on the glue actually holding everything together, use a, use a contact cement. So remember, we can only do one side at a time. So that is what we're going to do. I'm gonna need to get a new brush at some point because this one is stiff as a board. 
we need to let that dry for five to ten minutes uh, until it becomes tacky and then we can stick the two together and through the magic of editing you're not going to have to sit through that whole thing hopefully my hair didn't just get in the glue okay so after we stick both of these together we're probably going to want to let it sit for a little while longer anyway uh, just so that it doesn't start to come undone while we're cutting it to shape, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, so long as this line here in the back is relatively straight or uh, centered, if you have some sort of uh, peak or design going back there, um, you should be good because remember, we're just going to cut all the rest of this away. But to keep it from wobbling around, uh, we're just going to let it dry like that a little bit more. Now I'm going to go over this with uh, my burnisher just to sort of stick that down a little bit because this is contact cement so it requires a little bit of force you can use a rolling pin uh, you can just step on it if you want to it's only been about five minutes but i'm using my best judgment here we're just going to move uh, the paper and everything out of the way i think i'd actually like to use this knife for a little bit more control but we're just going to trace around the belt blank here go slow and easy and take multiple passes if you need to Okay, so there we see one edge is nice and flush. I'm just gonna go around, do the whole thing. Just be careful not to use too much pressure because you don't wanna run into swerving off and then cutting the entire belt plank through the center. That would not be good. So just go nice and easy. And make sure you're keeping the blade of your knife uh, straight in alignment with the belt plank too because if you come in at a slight angle, you're gonna be lined up with the belt plank, but the edge on the top is either gonna be beveled in or out, which you, which you don't wanna do unless you're doing it on purpose. Okay, there we go. Now, if this is all you wanted to do, um, you could just call it a day right there. You could rivet it, you could stitch it, you could do whatever you wanted, but you could essentially be done right here. But I'm gonna take a couple of uh, extra little steps that um, are technically not mandatory to try to make this as good as it can be. Um, my alignment was a little bit off there, which is disappointing, but overall it's fine. I'm gonna do both sides because just remember that depending on the way that you're going to be tying or fastening your belt, this side might actually be facing away from uh, the outside of your body, which means you're gonna go through all of this work, put a, a, a little leather shape on your belt, and then no one's ever gonna see it. So that would be the case if I didn't do both sides. So I'm gonna do both sides because that way, whichever side uh, is being seen has that little bit of decoration. So we're just gonna repeat that process for this side now. So if you are planning on buying a belt blank to try to do this with, um, rather than using one that you already have or just going to the thrift store to buy a belt that's already been worn. Um, Store-bought belt blanks tend to be very, very thick and you're going to struggle when you're trying to do that medieval style knot with them because they're not, they don't have the right width to thickness ratio and they're, they're not going to lay in a nice flat knot. So if you're buying a belt blank from like Hobby Lobby or Tandy or something like that, remember that those are meant to be worn in the modern way where there's no uh, fancy knot to keep the tail out of the way. So they're going to be a lot thicker. They're going to be a lot sturdier. So you either need to uh, go over them to thin them out with like sandpaper or a sky knife or something like that to get the thickness down or you need to really break them in really well so that you can get that knot properly otherwise it's just not going to look right okay there we go it's starting to look shape like already it's again not perfect but that's all right because the more uh, finishing we do to this the better it's going to look so the next thing i'm going to do uh, is i'm going to grab my edge groover here and remember that these are all optional steps. So if you don't have any of these tools, um, you might be able to fake something. If you just have an all, you might be able to scratch something in, use a ruler to keep the lines nice and straight. Um, but you don't need all of these things in order to do this. I happen to have them, so I'm using them. So I'm just gonna drop in a groove line here. I'm not gonna stitch it, but it's just gonna help make it look a little bit more professional. Oops, went off target there a little bit. Just gonna go ahead and do the other side. Luckily, this is the side that'll be on the back. So um, here's a little tip. If you're not sure if you're gonna do it right, uh, do the side that's not gonna be seen first. So you get a practice round. Now you could also stop it there if you wanted to, but uh, I'm not gonna stop. Can't stop, won't stop. So the next thing I'm gonna do is uh, just quickly change out this tool head 
for my um, edge beveler. And what this is going to do is it's going to round off the edges and it's gonna make the inconsistencies in the cut. As you can see, it's not, well, maybe you can't see it, but it's not perfectly uh, symmetrical. This is gonna hide that a little bit. I don't know if that's the intended purpose of this, but I find that it does do that. So if you have a cut that's not perfectly straight or it's got a little bit of a corner, this is gonna fix that. Make sure you do the edge that's actually uh, coming into direct contact with the belt where there's a little lip because if you bevel that down, it's less likely to pop back up again. We're gonna go, just go over the edges here with a little bit of water first, and that is so that we can use uh, the slicker. This thing, this is a slicker, and it's gonna smooth out those edges. It's gonna make them nice and shiny. And I find that it also helps to marry uh, the two pieces together so that they look less like they're three pieces stacked and then glued together, and more like it's sort of one piece. And look at how nice that looks all sandwiched in there. So I actually did a little bit of a test here um, and I didn't like the way this one came out with the stamps. So I ended up taking it off the belt and then redoing uh, the side because I decided that when I'm doing tooling, I am able to get a much sort of deeper, uh, more pronounced pattern than I am with the stamps. I don't know if that's a technique thing. I don't know if that is a stamp thing because the stamps I purchased are super cheap or something like that, but I have decided to go for uh, a hand carved pattern here instead. And that's what it looks like after when everything is beveled. So that's not really necessary or part of this video. I overcomplicated this by wanting to do my own hand carved design, but there's no reason that you have to do that. So final step after this is dried, which I'm gonna speed up with a uh, hair dryer is we're actually going to paint this over. I have some outdoor acrylic steel colored sort of silver paint. And you might be thinking, well, Kramer, uh, you went through all that trouble to do a nice design. It's got a lovely uh, patina on it now. Isn't it blasphemy to uh, paint over that? And I might've thought the same thing um, a little while ago, but there's a couple reasons I'm doing this. The first one uh, is that I want the buckle and the shape to match. That's kind of what they're supposed to do. Uh, the second reason is that I'm curious to know if this will work. So this is, uh, again, one of those experiments that we're doing at my expense, uh, just to, so that you guys can learn something. And three, um, we know in the medieval period that they are oftentimes highly decorating uh, a lot of their pieces of equipment. They're decorating the belts, they're painting their scabbards. So it's not out of the question uh, for me that they would be painting this sort of leather. The appreciation for the raw material and the beauty of the raw material, uh, I think is very much uh, a more modern thing. Not to say that they didn't have raw leather in the medieval period, but it was very common for them to paint things like this. Even their castles, they were whitewashing uh, their wooden castles to make them look like maybe they were stone. So for me, it kind of makes sense that I would be painting this leather shape to make it look like maybe it was a metal shape uh, or just slightly decorating it some more to show off that I've got a little bit of wealth. So we're gonna try to keep this as even as possible and just paint that on. It's probably gonna take a couple of coats. And we're gonna make sure that that paint gets in everywhere. Maybe I should be doing a black base coat, but it's really neither here nor there for me. And I've got just a little bit of duct tape here so that I can get all over the edges. And what we definitely wanna do is eliminate the brush strokes so that it looks like it's one single piece of metal rather than a painted piece of leather. It's another potential bonus for painting over uh, the leather work is if you're not super happy with how your stamping or how your carving turned out, if it's not super detailed, it doesn't matter. You're gonna paint over it. It's gonna hide a lot of that. And then what you're gonna be left with is sort of the general overall shape of the design, uh, but the, the overall detail isn't as important. Looks pretty decent, even has some uh, some shine to it, which I'm liking. And the, the paint's seeping into the leather, so it's it's giving the paint coat some, some texture to it, which I like it, and almost has this sort of hand-forged, barely polished look. This is the moment of truth. The paint has dried, and I'm now going to see if the antiquing gel, this is Fibing's uh, leather antiquing finish in black, is actually going to take to the paint or if it's not going to do that at all. But the idea with Antiguan gel is that it goes on, then you wipe off the excess and it gets into all the crevices and, and, and gives them a little, um, not really a highlight because it's darker, um, but it will accentuate. It's not quite as pronounced as I'd like it to be. I'm thinking maybe instead of uh, wasting the Antiguan gel, since I am painting this anyway, uh, I'm going to antique it with paint instead. So learning opportunity here, hopefully. Don't want to knock that paint over with the excess of the belt. Um, so I've got black paint here, and I want to just show 
what I think is going to be the difference between uh, the bonding capability. The acrylic paint should um, leave a little bit more residue than the antiquing gel will because I think the antiquing gel really is supposed to set in, uh, whereas the black paint is going to give us uh, a little bit of color depth here, I believe. I don't have a degree in this or anything, so I guess we're going to find out. So we're going to paint this on kind of like the antiquing gel, um, and then I'm going to wipe everything away, and it should leave us with a bit more uh, color depth. That's a theory. If it doesn't, then I'm just going to call it a day, probably. I'm trying to leave a little bit more there on the surface, and it still does have a little bit of that uh, shine from before, but we're almost matting it down a little bit. This is doing more of what I wanted to do. It's giving it some texture. And then I can always go back in with the silver or even a lighter color silver paint to, to do highlights if I feel the need to do that or if I feel there's too much black. You see, by comparison, this side looks fake, doesn't it? This side looks not like real metal, whereas this one, it's, it's starting to have a little bit of depth of color to it. I'll go back in and, and, and touch that up. But this side looks plastic, whereas this side looks more real. Man, I wish I had taken a prop making class. It's pretty cool what you can come up with just through simple trial and error. There we go, look at that. Already looks so much better. And the longer you leave acrylic paint like this on the actual uh, item itself, the, the darker it's going to stay once you wipe off the excess there. That dark layer really does give it that sort of patinaed metal finish, uh, whereas before it just looked super plastic. Even this side, by compare, like this side, which I just did, looks better than this side. And pay very close attention to. Now, I wish I had. I have another brush. It's right here. Excellent. So I am going to have to go ahead and touch up uh, some of this because it ended up being too dark. And now instead of looking um, patinaed, it looks painted. Just going to go over some of that again. And this is fine because we have that dark layer underneath now, almost as if we had started with um, a black base layer. We're now painting over that again. And all of these layers, so long as it um, doesn't dry bubbled or anything, it's all just going to add depth of color to the piece when we're done. This is great. I was thinking that this was going to be a lot. I mean, it's still a simple project, but I was thinking it was going to not have a whole lot to it other than just cutting some leather pieces. But this has actually been a very, very enjoyable process. Highly recommend that you try this out. It's a lot of fun. Easy enough to do that you don't have to stress over it. It's easy to fix mistakes. If you've never leather worked before, this might be a decent place to start. It's a small project. You can complete it in a day. If you play with minifigures like Dungeons and Dragons or Warhammer 40K, you'll probably be really good at this better than I am. So what I'm looking to eliminate are any smudges or streaks that are not all going in the same direction because, quote unquote, when this was polished, the wheel, the grinding wheel is sandstone, would most likely all be going in the same direction because metal has a grain to it. Um, so anything that looks out of the ordinary, I got to cover that up because that doesn't make any sense. So I'm always brushing in the same direction unless I know I'm going to go over it again. Areas where there's too much black, I don't want to overpaint it. I want to leave just a little bit of that color uh, in there, but I'm just going to cover it slightly so it's not as pronounced because the key with a lot of this is just simply not to overdo it. Subtlety is the name of the game here. You start to feel like you're overworking it, just just go do something else, come back to it with a fresh eye, and, and uh, you'll start to find your way again. I'm trying to pay special attention here towards the tip of the shape, because that is really the area that is likely to receive the most wear and tear as it's going in and out of the buckle, so that is the area, I think, that should simultaneously be the brightest um, from coming into contact with other metal, and then also have maybe a little bit of scuffing, but very light scuffing. I think the biggest giveaway with this that it's not actually metal is actually the, the thickness of both the cuts and of the, um, of the material itself, because anything that was made out of metal probably would look a lot more delicate, whereas this looks 
This is like the Lark version of a uh, of a belt shape. It doesn't have that sort of refined angle or edge. So the final step here is to uh, go ahead and rivet this. I would like to do that just because I like the extra support uh, in addition to the glue, just to make sure that everything's staying together. You could stitch it if you wanted to. Stitching for me kind of gives away that this is not actually metal, which breaks the illusion that I'm going for. Uh, so I've selected the largest size that I have of these, uh, just a very basic double cap sort of steel colored nickel plated rivets. Um, so we've reached the point of the project where once again, we've done a lot of work. I'm going to experiment and I could just screw up the whole thing because these might not be the right sized rivets. You wanna make sure that you're getting rivets that are long enough to accommodate the built up thickness you're gonna have of the leather. I'm gonna be cutting it pretty close. Um, so wish me luck. I'm gonna go ahead and use this as a hole punch because uh, it's slightly easier and I can. We're gonna set it there first. Got these little circles coming out everywhere. So we're gonna put uh, two rivets on the back, one here in each corner, and then one there at the very front. The finished product. So with the shape added to the end of this, it has so much more weight to it. It just feels very different than it. It feels a lot less flimsy. And when I'm putting this on, right there just look at the difference there look at that look at how that shines in the light right there man i'm i'm really happy with how this thing turned out and it just looks so much better than it did before here in the footage from my witcher video if you haven't seen that there is a link right there but it just looks so much better this way with that little bit of added detail and then it matches the belt buckle and then it brings everything together and because it's heavier down here and that there's that little extra bit of thickness not only is that that going to keep the belt from flopping around too much it is going to stay uh, where it's a Supposed to, but it's also not going to come undone if you're doing a belt knot sort of like I am just to keep the end of the tail out of the way. It's not going to come undone as easily like that. So if you're going to do all the steps that I did for this um, with the painting and the carving and doing all of that extra work, it's probably still not going to take you much more than a day um, if you're working efficiently and you're sort of just focused and sitting there. It still didn't take me more than six hours or so. And if you just wanted, if you didn't want to do the painting or you just didn't want to do anything at all and you just wanted to add two pieces of leather, rivet it and call it a day, it would take you less than two hours, definitely less than two hours. This is not only a cost-effective uh, way that you can add that shape look to your belt and help medievalize it a little bit more, uh, but it's also a very simple project that anyone can do, and it's a great entry point as well. Now, my challenge to my friends over at Skilltree, who just reached 100,000 subscribers, so big congratulations to you, Kit and Maddie. Um, make one of these out of copper. Show us how to make one of these out of copper or bronze or something like that. Break the forge out and show us how this is really done because I'd love to see that. So that's going to do it for today's video everyone thank you so much for watching and until next i see you i would like to wish you good luck on your adventures